Hi, Derek and Steen. It's so nice to have you here on the podcast. Hey, Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Yeah. I'm so excited to talk about your new book on lack on and depression. Depression and melancholia. So how did you come up with this book? Why did it come about? Well, actually, we had a very beautiful uh, painting uh, that we wanted to organize something around. And that's why we invented the book uh, and thought that maybe uh, depression and melancholia would be a good topic that could accompany the painting. Huh? So, uh, no, no, that, that's not true. I'm, I'm just to say that I'm really happy with that painting, that we could use it. Um, it's by a Belgian artist, Thierry de Cordier. Oh, wow. Um, he he made these fantastic paintings of of the North Sea, um, where uh, the the French signifier uh, mer uh, is also uh, echoing mother, and he's a French speaking painter actually, and he has these beautiful uh, scenic paintings of the sea, which are very like dark and and overwhelming. Um, but I think that obviously the, the main reason why we wrote that book is that we we kind of live in, in, in times where many people experience this darkness and and despair and hopelessness. And we see um, a mental health care culture that is getting organized around that, with which we are not so happy with the way the mental health culture is organized. And I think that we wanted to respond to that, seeing that um, a couple of colleagues um, in the field, Lacanian psychoanalysts, had been writing, writing great papers in the past, or we had heard them delivering a paper on a conference. And I think that um, Derek was the one who asked me, shouldn't we do something with it and, and bring these things together and, and bring them together in a book as some kind of of an answer to that, to that problem that is so particular to our culture today. Maybe I'll just add as well. I mean, in a way that you could argue that of the many agendas we had in the book, um, one was to think through uh, and speak a little bit about the Lacanian orientation towards depression generally. Um, so we could say a little bit more about that. And of course, the other was to think about the specificity um, of melancholia as uh, a diagnostic um, kind of substructure within psychosis. Um, and I think between Stain and myself, the sense was that, you know, within the, the domain of Lacanian psychoanalysis, um, those topics are sometimes taken as understood. But when trying to speak to colleagues from other domains of psychoanalysis, one needed to do a little bit of um, uh, interpretation or bridging of those concepts. So we, in the book, there's a bunch of chapters on, on melancholia and what it means if melancholia is to be seen uh, within the broader uh, sub structure of psychosis. That's the other one. And then also just to, to say something about why Lacanians are so critical about the concept of depression. Um, and that's kind of the opening chapter. It also, uh, Stephanie Swales also takes up that topic as, as others do. But um, I think for both of us, that was a really crucial task particularly given how free and easy we hear this language of depression being applied left, right, and center all the time in a rather amorphous master signifier kind of way. Um, so I don't know if, if you wanted to add any more on that, Stain, but those two agendas seem to be quite important to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 also, I think um, our idea that it, it would be good to both formulate um, the experience of depression in, in neurosis as well as in psychosis, because often you see also among Lacanians that they either, when discussing depressions, either switch to neurosis and see it as the contemporary neurotic complaint, or uh, rather discuss it as melancholia and its psychosis, whilst I guess we thought that, well, the, the nuance is that it, it's transstructural, um, and so therefore it's, it's very good to, to position them next to one another in both structures of neurosis and psychosis. Yeah, and very important because you don't often see that being addressed. No, I think most most authors, because also when you would look at the individual papers, of course, each individual paper is rather focusing on either melancholia or neurotic depression uh, in the book. But I, I we, I, I think, can found it kind of important to to bring it together, not to juxtapose uh, 
um, these, but rather to, to 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 make clear that there is a certain complexity in the clinic, um, and that especially as Lacanians, we should be sensitive to that complexity as well. Um, so it's also an invitation for Lacanians to to kind of keep broad in 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 listening to in listening to people um, consulting as in clinical practice. Yeah, and it is in the field, of course, it's frustrating to see, you know, the medicalization of everything, which thing you've written a lot about in the past. Um, and it does seem to be nice that there is this shift, even in broader psychology, a little bit, a little bit more towards like looking at the social structures and and different reasons that people might be coming depressed rather than it just being this biological illness that needs to be medicated. So it does seem to be like there might be an opening somewhere, but often when I see that and I get excited about it, then it seems like the kind of medical model clamps down all the more. I mean, one, one of the things I think we're quite proud of as well is in that introductory chapter where we we try to list a whole series of Lacanian objections to what we could call the discourse of, of depression. Uh, you know, we were obliged to touch on this uh, famous Lacanian somewhat provocative argument, this idea that uh, that depression is a kind of moral failing. So clearly this sounds scandalous, it sounds problematic for a number of reasons. Um, and we, we try to properly contextualize Lacan's argument there um, and one one aspect of that is to say that we should not lose sight of the ethical duty of the subject to to put into speech, to 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 render into uh, speakable content um, part of the attempt to grapple with unconscious underpinnings and and aspects of of one's suffering. So we try and make that argument, but what we also try to do is say that the Lacanian argument by whereby um, depression is a, is a moral failing also applies actually to contemporary discourses of depression. That's a kind of moral failing as well, in as much as through the medicalization of, of, of depression, we circumvent the, the ethical task of, of speech, of analysis, of, of the, the long ongoing work of trying to grapple with something of the singularity of a person's suffering. So that's kind of the one of the opening arguments in the first chapter that we, we, we're quite proud of. And, and I think it's it's a kind of, although it sounds very you know terminologically Lacanian or something, it's also kind of a, a basic argument that one should not forget about the importance of speech and clinical work and the singularity of a subject's suffering. Yeah, and I think connected to that, it's also um, uh, certainly a critique of contemporary society where there is this belief that, uh, on the one hand, this belief that um, biomedical explanations would be so powerful that they can help us in, 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 in treating people and overcoming their problems. Um, like, there's been billions of dollars that have been invested in research on genetics and on the brain uh, and on medication. Uh, but at the end, we observe that the effect is, is not so spectacular. Um, indeed, medical consumption increased hugely uh, during the last 20 years, but it's not that suffering diminished substantially. Um, and I think that especially therefore, um, there, there is this need for an alternative. Um, and the alternative is not to be found at the level of some fixed solution, some mechanical solution that that is to be to be given to people. As 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 I'm giving you this treatment, and you you will uh, you will be better off in the end. But rather, this difficult task of um, organizing a transference, organizing a kind of relation with someone in which speech about the very difficulties a person has been confronted with about these difficulties in a context in a job context in a family context that this is what will be working and um yeah so obviously that's the uh, the also a critique that uh more cultural critique that that we also start from uh in in well, different authors start from in the book yeah absolutely um Maybe you could say a little bit more about melancholia, because I feel like that's not addressed so much, uh, even like among psychoanalysts, people don't seem to understand the differences between depression and melancholia. I think that's really important. Um, I, I, I sometimes wondered, you know, if we if we go back to the 
uh, the introductory text that that Bruce Fink writes, um, the clinical introduction to Lacanian psychoanalysis. He very nicely sets out all structures and gives you know examples, but often I found in introductory text, melancholia isn't really given much prominence as as uh, a substructure within psychosis. So I think we really wanted to say something a little bit more about that. Um, one of the chapters that we were very happy to be able to include was Darren Leader's fairly lengthy chapter, Some Thoughts on Mourning and Melancholia, which is kind of a nicely complex engagement with that. Um, but one of the questions that then comes up, and you'll be able to anticipate this just in terms of how I've been speaking about melancholia, um, folks sometimes will ask, well, why is melancholia necessarily within the domain of psychosis? And maybe we could say a few words about why that is the case. And I'm hoping Stain will, will also chip in a little bit with this. But looking through the chapters that we've got again, one way of making that um, description is to think about the how object A is manifest within various forms of depression, various forms also actually of mourning, as opposed to how it appears in, in melancholia. And uh, just looking over some of the chapters again, I found some nice um, contributions from various authors who, who, who theorize this in somewhat different ways. Um, one very helpful and I think astute observation comes from Russell Grigg when he, he talks about how we could think about melancholia as a condition where object A exists in a real state, as a kind of burning object, as a kind of devouring object. And we find a, a, a similar kind of description in Patricia Gerovici and Jamison Webster's chapter in the book, where they make this distinction, where they say melancholy is not simply about the loss of an object, about the loss of something, but it's about something that persists. There's an object that takes on the form of a devouring vortex of pain. That's a, a, paraphrasing some of their words. And in both of those conceptualizations, we have, with reference to Lacanian terminology, uh, a prioritization of thinking the position of object A. And object A is something that cannot simply be mediated or managed easily in the same way that it may be done in either a process of mourning or as considered within the register of lack, as we might expect in the case of neurosis, but as something which stays in place, which exercises this uh, uh, toxic, devouring um, forcefulness. So I I'll stop there just because I'm, I'm curious also to see what Stain has to say about that. And of course, there's multiple different ways of thinking the difference between melancholia and mourning on the one hand, uh, and melancholia and neurotic forms of, of depression on the other. But I think it was quite useful looking again across the contents of the book to see how many people are thinking about that in terms of the theorization of object A. That for me was quite instructive in, in working in an editorial capacity on the book. Yeah, I think the, the object A quality in melancholia is of course an, a, a very important one. And then um, I think it's, it's good to see that what is so particular about the object A in melancholia is that it's situated at the, at the side of, of, of the subject. Uh, so it's situated at my side. So there is no object A outside projected onto the other, which is so typical of, of neurosis and also of neurotic depression, because neurotic depression is a longing for recognition. It's a, it's a longing for someone who would actually see me, hear me, give me um, what, what I need. Um, so that, and, and of course this, but maybe we can say a little more later about neurotic depression, but there clearly the object A is at the side of the other. And I think in melancholia, it's at the side of the subject, but not so much in terms of, um, something that I have, but rather in terms of a, of a fundamental lack as something that the, the signifier cannot do anything with. But at the same time, it's felt at the level of jouissance as a burden, as a, as a too much that makes it unbearable, unbearable to be me, unbearable to be here as an existence. So it's it's really the pain and the burden that is so crucial. And um, connected to that, so that's the object position. I think it's also very important to see the, um, the role of the other um, and that we classically see in melancholia that there is a certain distrust or disbelief that a solution might come from from, from the other. So, and therefore, it, that it's it's an it's an issue of uh, foreclosure of a name of the father, meaning that there is no hope or no 
belief possible in an underlying order or an underlying rescue that 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 might come from the other that there is no hope at that level um so if another is soft it's rather out of despair um and rather to to be the testimony in relation to another in the transference that i'm hopeless that nothing counts anymore for me and that i'm not counting anymore so uh therefore also in the transference in melancholia someone is positioning himself or herself as this piece of waste uh and actually wondering what the other will do with it um uh, but you could say that at the level of of of, of the transference um the patient in the object position and the expectation is that uh, the analyst will throw the person away. Uh, and this is, you could say, psychotic without um, often having in melancholia the very uh, specific psychotic symptoms of hallucinations and delusions, which sometimes are indeed there, uh, but not so out of the out in the open. Um, and also in, in terms of in, in the transference that it's often it's not like um, erotomania or um, the violence that is expected from the from the analyst, but at this, it, it has to do with being thrown away and, and being worth nothing, um, which is so particular, I think, of, of this melancholia. Part of what Stain is saying there so nicely, I think, links also to one of the, you know, standard uh, rules of thumb, so to speak, uh, in thinking very, you know, um, speculatively, first steps towards diagnosis, one wants to always ask, you know, how, how does certainty function for a given subject? And the idea is that often in neurosis, you know, there's some vacillation or questioning or uncertainty or whatever. Uh, prevarication, whereas often when we are getting a bit closer to apparently symptomatic phenomena in psychosis, this is distinguished by a degree of certainty. And so I, I just, as Stain was talking, this idea that there's no hope, no belief that the other will help me, one also there finds the certainty of the conviction that one is worthless. And of course, that yes. takes us all the way back to, to, to Freud talking about in melancholy, we find this clamorous, a very loud, uh, 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 you know, confessions of one's own worthlessness, which are not there for the other to go, oh, no, you're OK. The other is, is irrelevant in those pronouncements because the subject is certain of them and they can't be, as it were, argued out of them. There, there's a kind of non-dialectical aspect to that insistence of worthlessness. So it's just a basic point, but I think it links nicely to what, what Stain's saying and also helps us think about in what ways uh, melancholia should be thought of as psychotic. And you could say one of the areas that it does seem to fit within psychotic structure, at least how Lacanians understand it, is that certainty, that almost delusory certainty in one's own absolute worthlessness. Um, we could also briefly touch on the topic of, of, of delusions and more, you know, traditionally louder psychotic symptoms. And, and Stain also made, made the point very nicely that one can be working with someone who's melancholic without those. Um, and I think that's important to bear in mind also considering how non-Lacanians hear this language of psychotic structure, right? So you can be a melancholic subject, a melancholic subject who professes and has certainty about one's own worthlessness, who is suffering, who is suffering from um, an excessiveness of object A, which can take on many different forms, but without hallucinations, without apparent delusions, even though there is a potentially a certainty of one's own worthlessness. So what else might one hear? And one of the things that's fascinated me a lot, and we see it a little bit in Genevieve Morel's um, chapter on uh, Susan Stern, this, this American uh, revolutionary, and of course, uh, <laughs> um, Vanessa, you know this material as well, um, that she describes her as having almost these reveries of death. So I suppose I just want to open it up to both of you, uh, Vanessa, and also knowing that you're very familiar with that material uh, and Stain. Um, sometimes I think one will find not necessarily these uh, delusions, hallucinations, but one might find a kind of reverie of death, a kind of um, sort of sumptuous imaginings of various suicidal schemas or, um, or picturings of annihilation. Um, I, I could give some examples, but I, I'd rather throw it over to you guys to see if that resonates with you in any way. Yeah, but I'd rather like to, to pick in on, on, on what Derek was saying, 
because um, I, th I think um, indeed what is often very clear in working with, with persons that we would situate in the, in, in the structure of melancholia is that we have this violent imagery. Uh, so really like the, these, these ideas of um, destroying oneself, of being destroyed, of being dead already, um, or really of the act of um, jumping out of a window, being torn apart, rotting away. Um, so really this, this decomposition. So when, when Lacan says that object A, it's, it's, it's the remainder, it's a piece of waste, all waste in his, theory, in his theory, object A is that, because we speak and there is Jewish sounds arising from the body and with signifiers, we deal with this jouissance, but there is a remainder, says Lacan. There is a piece of waste. And then it sounds abstract, unless you take it in, 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 in the problem of, of melancholia, because there you really see this identification with being this someone who doesn't value anymore. There is a system outside of me, be me meaning the, the other, that is so functioning in, in, in a certain way, but I'm not part of that system. I'm not part of my family. I'm not part of, of my culture. I'm not really a part of the company for which I'm working. I'm an outsider and I'm bad and I'm not worth of being a part. And so there, then you see this violent self accusations that are often combined with this imagery of, 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 the, of violent destruction that hounds these people. Um, and that, of course, is very difficult for, for people to bear. Um, and what we also see, I think, at the level of, of clinical work, that often for clinicians, it's very difficult to work with, with these people um, because also for a clinician, it's, it's hard to hear this kind of violent things being articulated uh, by a person. And then, yeah, it, it might also be tempting for a clinician to to stop working with them and to, for example, say that they should take medications um, as a solution of not having to listen anymore to this complaint. Um, and, and obviously, why we also make this clear distinction between neurotic depression and psychotic melancholia is because in clinical work, we will have a different focus, um, whilst in neurosis, um, it will be oriented towards better speech. Um, saying the truth uh, about your life that, that you have been hiding away, finding the signifiers, being courageous, not misrecognizing things from your own life. Uh, that, that will be the track to be followed in case of neurotic depression. Here, I think we will go for limiting the experience, uh, not hiding it away, but not hoping that by, by really working through and, and talking about all the being nothing and being worthless, uh, that this will be the solution. And that rather in, in transference, in speaking with someone, that the, the analyst will have to find some kind of a limit, a possibility to stop thinking about it, a possibility to stop talking about it without anticipating this act of violence, because this is often what what, what is... Uh, uh, present in, in, in the transference and the treatment of, of melancholia, it's a continuous threat of a violent passage to the act, what we call it as Lacanians, meaning in, in melancholia often um, a suicide, but it's, uh, it's a suicide that is meant to, to be a resolution for the other. So finally, finally, people will get we will not have to take into account me anymore because I'm the one who is obstructing uh, things going smoothly. So for example, a, a person uh, committing suicide because he, he doesn't want to be the burden anymore in the family. He doesn't want to burden his children anymore with his presence, with his being. So therefore it's better to commit suicide. So this kind of uh, altruistic suicides is very common to, to melancholia, as in starting from the belief that finally the other will have a better life because I'm I, as the piece of waste, will no longer be there as the factor that is obstructing the smooth working of the social system, of, of, of the of the social link uh, between people. And so this is why this distinction is so very important. Um, and also why in clinical work it's more about limiting and as uh, limiting the experience and helping to create stops where 
uh, where thought and speech can speech can switch to something else away from the idea of the waste and the nothingness of of of, of this person's existence. I'd like to pick up on a couple of those themes as well. Um, you know, I, I've been fascinated by that reveries of death, the violent Im imaginary that often accompanies um, the speech or uh, the expressions of, of people who are undergoing melancholic suffering. And so the, the Susan Stern chapter with Genevieve Morel is, is about a woman who does a very radical kind of leftist revolutionary politics um, and she's constantly talking about, you know, what death, I am almost dead already, I'm committed to this death, so on and so forth. But two features out of what Stain was describing come very nicely to the forefront. One is the idea of the outlaw. And, you know, I don't mean that in a moral sense, but uh, obviously I'm, I'm sort of riffing on the Lacanian idea that psychotic structure is, in a sense, to be outside of law, hence the reference back to foreclosure, hence the reference back to the name of the father not operating. So what starts to become very fascinating, and I, I think there's still more work to be done here, is how certain melancholic subjects locate themselves in this outlaw sphere. So one of one of the, the arguments I try to make in my chapter is about uh, Christopher McCandless, the, the famous guy who is the subject of Into the Wild, which is both a book and a film, Sean Penn's film. Uh, and I, I'm not certain about him. I mean, this is kind of an illustrative example that links to a piece of clinical work. But sometimes you'll find someone trying to find their version of being off grid or living in the domain of death drive or living in the domain of outlaw outside the symbolic. And, you know, to a certain extent, there can be creative forms of doing this. But there's a wide variety of different modalities of trying to maintain this kind of existence outside of law or outside of prevailing norms, whatever. Um, so we see a social and symbolic dimension to this, how, how people try to live outside of law in a way, and it can take multiple different, different forms. But the other way of thinking that same idea in a slightly different register is to say it's not always just how one finds a means of living a non-social link life in a sense that still sustains one whether it means going off grid and you know disconnecting from society um but is also to think about what it means to live in the domain of death drive and of course you know even saying that everybody's really hearing the famous freud quote that it is in melancholia that we see um the pure state of death drive something like that um so i think that's also important because it, it does you know obviously links back to suicidality but it also should be emphasized that death drive here doesn't necessarily mean something purely suicidal it often entails that but death drive itself also uh, introduces the possibility of a newness um and uh, of certainly excess jouissance but also oddly enough paradoxically of a type of replenishment potentially so I just wanted to highlight both of those things, the outlaw dimension, um, the alternative way of trying to locate oneself within what is sometimes experienced as a constraining or, or, or difficult or uh, less than viable toxic sociality. And also how you could say that certain melancholic subjects find a way with death drive such that they're constantly in a state of death as opposed to in a state of life. I'll just say one more thing. To, to reiterate something that, that Stain had said, what I think it means to work with melancholia and to, to take seriously the, the notion of melancholia is to put it in what sounds quite simple terms, that the melanch melancholic subject has made a profound identification with the place of the dead. And that doesn't just mean, you know, oh, I imagine, oh, I have an affinity. It means in a sense of ready being identified in the proper, properly psychoanalytic sense of that term with the state of death or, or deadness, such that everyday sociality is often very difficult to manage, um, particularly because it's very difficult to communicate something of that state to people who are <laughs> differently positioned relative to death drive and, and living an everyday life. I think another great point that Stan was making was this uh, yeah, suicidality as a way to kind of relieve the others. Right. But uh, the kind of more neurotic suicidality is often aimed at like making a point to the other, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that that was really helpful because, you know, Passage lacked 
um, this dramatic leaving the conversation with the big other, so to speak, as opposed to an acting out, is often a way of also thinking about, well, you know, this is uh, something happening in the domain of psychosis as opposed to something that's happening in the domain of, of neurosis. But just one further point, emphasizing something both of you have said, what sometimes is a little bit surprising is the ethical, or we could, I suppose, say the ethicality that one sometimes sees in melancholia. So all of these things, whether it's reveries of violent imagery, whether it's um, death drive in, in, in various forms, but often quite a potent sense of an ethical commitment, which initially sounds a little odd, but of course it makes sense if you, if you take into account the function, the role, the excessiveness of superego uh, in, in melancholia. But it's, it's, it's always something that I think is quite striking when you find quite a, um, a as powerful ethical commitment to, for example, the belief that the world would be much better without me being here. Um, so there's a strong, whether we call that ethical or super egoic quality to it, that's something I think is also crucial to bear in mind. Incidentally, in the Genevieve Morel chapter of, um, of, of Susan Stern, you know, she's this revolutionary. So she does have also something of that, whatever we could call it, super egoic um, excessiveness in, 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 in that case. Well, and, and in this respect, this is also something that Freud already stressed in his paper on mourning and melancholia, that the the the, the self attack that is so uh, particular to to melancholia is always also an attack towards the other. Uh, so in, in in that respect, also what Derek was pointing to the the idea of the of the outlaw. Well, I think it's true, but it's it's also a criticism of the law. It's a criticism of the actual functioning of the social system around and a kind of a demonstration that the, the other is fundamentally lacking. Um, and there is no current correspondence between me as an object and the lack in the other, but I'm only there as, 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 a, as a waste product also because the other can't save me and the other will know that he can't save me. And so therefore it's also, um, you could say in a certain sense paradoxical why the melancholic would look for help because if you're really convinced that you shouldn't live, you just commit suicide. But it often has this quality of, of violent um, monstration of something, like a showing of something, a showing of the pointlessness of my own existence uh, in relation to the other. Um, and so this is also why people would start consulting a psychoanalyst uh, or, or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist also uh, with the idea, look how hopeless I am, look how violent I am towards myself, as if they're actually looking for someone who is there as a witness of this object position. And there, I think that Lacan's idea of uh, when treating psychosis, that's often the starting point, you are called as a witness, not as someone who knows how to solve it, but as a witness to this very particular kind of misery that you're living through and the particular kind of misery you're living through in melancholia is the your fate of not having a place in the world and then you look for someone who is witness to that so it's it's in a certain sense a bit paradoxical because then you're including yourself in some kind of a social bond and then of course the the entire work of psychoanalysis and of psychotherapy will be trying to find some solution how how to live because that's what the analyst is interested in, how to live, how to connect, how to relate, um, but without having a, a specific kind of solution, like do this, without having a dream, without having uh, a specific trajectory that we know that would be useful for another person, without having a desire from ourselves that we want to impose on, onto them, but by just being there as a pure witness, but very attentive, and, and, and looking for, I would stress again, looking for limits, stopping something, stopping something of the automatic dead drive related mechanism by switching to, to the possibility of something else. Um, yeah, it, it'd be nice to come back to the limits thing, but just to, just to build on that, um, one of the things I found fascinating, I, I was trying to sort of stumblingly get towards it, um, but I think, so, you know, staying nicely, um, articulates this paradox. Like if the big other isn't functioning in the same way for me as it is for other folks, if I'm not going to be persuaded that I do have worth, um, if I've in a sense had foreclosure and have left the conversation with the big other, why would I, why would I 
need a witness? Why would I come and speak to someone about it in the first place? Well, we've already said that if I am melancholic, I'm not going to be dissuaded of my worthlessness. But what kind of work is done with the speech then? And for me, what's fascinating is if we look at multiple and sometimes very empirically very different cases of melancholia, where there's been some way of locating oneself in a sort of outlaw way within the register of the death drive, as I was putting it. So um, that can take multiple forms. And maybe one clinical task there is to listen to how someone is doing this, positioning themselves within the domain of the dead. And that can take on multiple different forms. So it might mean going off grid. It, it, it might mean, you know, taking on a different life. It might mean a whole series of different kinds of things being revolutionary that's always posed at the very brink of suicidality. So that work of positioning oneself within a kind of almost like a genre or within a life that enables one to be to, to do something with death drive, to locate oneself outside of the law is is nicely described also towards the end of Darian Leader's chapter, where he talks about um, he's thinking about different uh, narratives and narrative structures that have existed historically. And, and he talks about how, for example, purgatory, this kind of uh, theological, you know, Christian narrative provides a way of the subject of death drive, the melancholic subject of locating themselves relative to death um, and, and, and outside of ness of life. Um, so I think that links both to the to the reveries of death thing um, and, and to a lot of what, what, what Stan yeah. was saying. Uh, yeah, maybe I can add that. Um, in, in one of the chapters that I wrote here in the book, um, I give the present a clinical case of a woman who is also convinced that she's not worth living. Uh, and I think there we have a good example of what it might clinically mean to, 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 to look for a limit, um, because this woman was really suffering from the fact that at, at a certain point, one of her best friends or her best friend died in a car accident. <clears throat> And she was talking, it, it was years ago, but she was talking about, about it to me in, in a very overwhelmed way, always and again in tears for weeks and weeks um, about, about that specific event. And I've been doing the work of listening to that. Um, but then at a certain point, she had the idea of designing a tattoo about it, um, which had some symbolic value, and she put it effectively on her body. Um, and then she kind of stopped talking about the death of her best friend. Um, and so in a certain sense, um, it's, it's probably by not trying to connect the death of the friend with everything going on in her life, but at the same time, letting it come and kind of um, encapsulating it in the transference, in the talking with me, um, that there it, it, it could stop. Her thoughts about it could stop. Uh, and they were kind of, onto her body then, uh, as if it was an icon of her suffering and no longer the continuous mental presence of that suffering. Uh, and so she invented through the therapy several uh, tattoos. She, she designed several tattoos that always and again refer to very painful aspects of her history. And compared to neurosis, I cannot say that she kind of worked this through. Uh, so, so to speak, if someone would ask her the story about her tattoo, she would probably again be in tears and torn apart, telling it again. Um, but she didn't feel the necessity anymore to do so every time she met someone because the the testimony of the suffering was very visible on her body. Uh, even if it was not understood by the other, the marking of the suffering was there for her very particularly in that kind of tattoo that she had. So that's that's also a limit. So it's listening, but it's also limiting the speech about it and, and not like a neurosis, like stimulating all the details and, and, and inviting someone to make links between, yeah, their partner, their life with their partner or with their parents and things like that. So it's not making these links, but helping not to make too many links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking about limits, it's usually very helpful to to turn to something very concrete or material. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we what 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 we often do. Huh? Um, but but then, of course, the challenge is also there for um, in, in Lacanian psychoanalysis because that could become very like um, symptomatic as well at, at the side of the analyst. 
like a certain fear of, of listening to the, the deep suffering of someone by always again focusing on 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 concrete things in in, in life uh, so um i think it's very important to, as an analyst in working with these uh, problems like melancholia to be very flexible in in shifting from one way of listening to another one of listen to another way of listening um and that this is very important your your possibility of switching actually I want to just add quickly to that. I mean, it's it, it's it's great to have this opportunity because we, you know, we write a lot, but we don't often, you know, get an opportunity to talk about these ideas and, and riff off one another. But I love that thing—a way of not making links. And I love that idea because both it enables it, it's it's one thing to bear in mind when listening to to those kinds of accounts. Um, it's also something which obviously has a, a very clear bearing on transference. How does one work with someone for whom the condition of not making links is a is a condition of possibility to survive in a sense, right? So you you have to be aware of how this will come to an end and how one has to be cautious in thinking the intensity of the transference because if someone is existing in a way which means one doesn't want to make links, at some point the the treatment itself can become. Um, an instance of the the terror of intimacy. I think that's a that's a line that I that Paul Vahagi uses somewhere, and he talks about the um, the terror of closeness yeah. that sometimes we find in melancholia, which is a really nice way I think of of highlighting some of these situations whereby we see uh, a, a suffering within the domain of intersubjectivity as well. I mean, we can go on to talk about that. But just one further theme about this way of not making links, it reminds me in the Christopher McCandless case, and again, I'm riffing off the idea of the, the outlaw, how Christopher McCandless in, in Into the Wild adopts for himself a pseudonym and starts calling himself um, Alexander Supertramp. And one of the arguments I try to make there, however successfully or not, is that the adoption of that name is in a way is an adoption of an anonymity you know super tramp is a kind of description it's also a big famous american rock band it's it's a signifier which is not we could argue both ways i suppose but does it function to pinpoint the singularity of him or does it enable a certain anonymity a certain stepping back from the the unsufferable insufferable conditions of sociality and even if the argument doesn't work, it's a nice illustrative way of trying to, to see how one might do some clinical work of trying to accommodate how someone exists in a way that is about not making certain social links, either because of the terror, uh, the terror of intimacy, the too much closeness, um, or, and, and here's, a, here's another thought, um, we could also think about death drive. And in Lacanian psychoanalysis, death drive is not this biological thing. And it's not necessarily to be linked simply to a drive to suicidality, but it could be thought of as a way of, of stepping outside of, in relative terms, because one never does that completely, trying to step outside of the symbolic to a certain extent. So with Christopher McCandless, you constantly find that breaking off of various social links, trying to step outside of um, the everyday required uh, constraints of norms and sociality. So just to throw that in there, I like that idea of how death drive is sometimes death drive against um, the finding a, an automatic given role within a symbolic framework. And of course, again, one here now also hears foreclosure overlapping with that way of thinking death drive. Maybe you should say something about neurotic depression because <laughs> we <we're talking laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. about about melancholia, and I think it's very important to make that point. But similarly, it's very important, I think, to 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 conceptualize neurotic depression. Um, maybe I, I can just say something about it, and Derek, you can you can add your perspectives. Huh? But I think um, all the chapters that we have in the book about neurotic depression, I'll start from Lacan's suggestion that um depression is is a moral failing but not so a moral failing generally but a moral failing you could say against the ethics of the well spoken uh, where lacan sees it as a, the the duty of, of of a subject to speak because we are only a subject because we are speaking we are not the ones who organize our speech intentionally we are organized because of the fact that we speak so the subject is an effect of the speech itself. So you can only be there as a subject in relation to another because there are signifiers that are 
all in some sense representing you without one of these signifiers being able to actually really present you. So that's subjectivity. And then what we see often, um, what is so what is so particular about oppression is that it's 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 a way of not talking anymore. It's a way of not having full speech anymore, meaning speech that matters about what is hurting you, what is uh, um, what is bringing you joy, what is frustrating you uh, in very specific situations like the situation of of your relationships, of your work, of what you love, of what you hate. Uh, so that it is in a certain sense in common to, to neurotic depression that something came to a halt. Uh, and then you get a, a, a person being overwhelmed by a feeling. And then I think very particular for the Lacanian Socratic model is that we won't focus on the emotion as such, uh, but rather see the, the emotion of sadness, for example, as an effect of a certain way of dealing with the signifier, of, of refraining from actually speaking, of actually saying what needs to be said. Um, and so if you conceptualize neurotic depression like that, it also means that we have a, a clue about what we have to do in, in treatment and in transference of people who present themselves with depression to a psychoanalyst. And that is that we have to create an atmosphere where speech is again possible um, and therefore it requires quite that that's a point that I make in the book um, on, on the, in, in the chapter on neurotic depression that requires quite a fundamental attitude of an analyst that is quite different from what people imagine that an analyst would do. Like people often imagine that an analyst should be very silent, a bit withdrawn and purely listening and maybe now and then giving an interpretation or saying something enigmatic maybe to, to the analysand. And I think that's exactly what is not working in, in, in depression because that's not stimulating this uh, full speech. And so therefore, if we want to start working with someone in a depressed neurotic state, it should rather, we should rather create kind of an invitation, a warm welcome in the world of words um, without being a guide about what is to be said, but uh, but clearly articulating a warm invitation uh, or an invitation that fits with what a person is needing, but a clear invitation to 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 speak and with sufficient support to help people to 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 speak. And in that chapter that I wrote in the book, I found some very interesting examples by Lacan himself. Like at one point, this is just an anecdote, but at one point there was. A uh, young French psychiatrist, Jean Clavreuil, who was consulting him, who started consulting him for deep depression. And um, he describes how warm Lacan was, how friendly Lacan was. And br briefly after the start of the sessions, he had to be hospitalized because of his um, suicidality. Um, and he describes how Lacan visit him, visited him in the hospital some 20 times, uh, which is all very go against going against the idea of the orthodox psychoanalyst who is like a silent figure but here we see clearly a, a person who is um, engaging in drawing someone into the social link drawing someone into the world of speech by clearly manifesting a desire to be there as someone who will listen to your speech um, and i think that this is also very important and this is I think also what, what is needed and, and why there is a certain crisis, maybe also in psychoanalysis, because the psychoanalysts are blinded by the idea that they must try to be some, some they have too much an imaginary idea of, of the ideal psychoanalyst, which is why at the level of the symbolic handling of the transference, they're often too absent and not at the right place for the person consulting them. And so therefore you could also say that we shouldn't just criticize the the bad mental health care workers who focus on depression, but it's also maybe a criticism that we have to formulate towards the psychoanalysts because they've been hiding too much away in their safe offices with their safe protocolized in their own way, way of working that they were not able to kind of really like welcome people with a different kind of suffering the suffering of the contemporary subject living in a post-capitalist world 
where the problems that you suffer from are different compared to the to neurotic problems from the 20th century. So, well, this is this is a lot of ideas, of course, but <laughs> I just want to introduce the idea of the neurotic depression here. Uh, that that's that's wonderfully said. I mean, I, I'll just add a little bit. I know we we we're running a bit short on time, but I mean, let, let's think of a scenario of someone who is stuck in a kind of repetitive lifestyle. There's a, a sense of uh, meaninglessness about one's existence. Um, and the more that someone comes to this person comes to therapy, there's it becomes kind of evident that there's almost a will not to know, a will not to put certain things into speech. And that stasis, which could, for example, be the uh, the result of an, an unconscious identification with some other figure in their life, whose whose life they are now, in a way, sleepwalking through, reenacting in a way which has dulled down or, or sidelined the possibility of desire almost altogether. This can manifest as a form of depression, right? So, if this is if this is depressive suffering in in uh, a neurotic mode then what does one do and i think stain has has nicely described some of how one could try to um to work in that situation but presumably part of what needs to be opened up is is speech is speech within conditions of transference is speech within conditions of transference which may establish or re-establish a social link which means working against repression and if the the therapeutic environment is not enabling those things, if it's not enabling us to work against repression, to enable speech, um, then you could say that the therapeutic domain is iatrogenic, that it's that it's assisting in the maintenance of this um, uh, non-speech, this non-speaking. It it is it is a kind of um, accomplice in in avoiding the ethical duty of speech within the context of transference to a subject supposed to know and all of those kinds of things. And just to, to do one further connection back to the broader discourse of depression, the broader discourse of depression is itself iatrogenic if it is not making enough room for the articulation, the enunciation of suffering of a subject within a speech condition such as that of psychotherapy where they can explore the multiple unexpected associative historical dimensions to what underpins that suffering. And I think maybe that's, uh, I know we're sort of running to, a little bit to, to an end, but we could say then that iatrogenic dimension of depression, whether it's the broader discourse of how we think about um, depression today as a kind of fundamentally medical condition that must be treated with some kind of medicine, um, we could see that there's an iatrogenic uh, dimension to certain forms of therapy, which likewise do not try and open up that dimension of speech uh, and the exploration of the subject's desire. And, and maybe that's one way to, to think about the failings of depression, is how various modes of conceptualizing or treating it do not open up those avenues of exploring the details of the subject's history through speech in, in, in a sufficiently explorative, supportive, analytical framework. Yeah, and, and I think that in the book, we have a beautiful chapter by Stephanie Swales, and she's actually bringing several cases together, several cases of the, within the, that fit within the structure of neurosis, where she articulates very clearly or very clinically uh, what this might mean um, in, in contemporary clinical work. Um, yeah, so it's just an invitation to, to read the book now. Wonderful. And thank you both so much for being here. And anytime you two want to get together and riff off of one another, feel free to <laughs> let me know and let's record it and let everyone benefit from the discussion. <laughs>